Hello, everyone, and welcome to CIBC's Economic Outlook webinar. Uh, my name is Steve Kuahara, and on behalf of CIBC's public sector and not-for-profit group, I'd like to thank you for attending to uh, did today's session. Uh, it looks like we have participants from a very broad range of public sector entities, charities, and not-for-profit organizations from across the country. So it's great that uh, you're all able to join us today. Uh, given that it's still relatively early in the new year, we thought it would be a good time to discuss the economic outlook for 2021. So our guest speaker today is Andrew Grantham, a CIBC senior economist. And Andrew's going to uh, give a presentation on where he thinks the economy is headed this year, uh, in particular given the impact of COVID-19 and the second wave of the recovery. Uh, and as part of his comments, Andrew will discuss some of the key trends and factors that will impact public sector and not-for-profit organizations in the coming year. So hopefully you'll be able to get some information that will, will be helpful to you in your budgeting and planning for 2021. Now, Andrew is going to be taking us through a set of PowerPoint slides on screen. We will make those slides available to you in the coming days through your CIBC Relationship Manager. And after Andrew concludes his prepared remarks, we will have a Q&A discussion uh, with the audience. So we would encourage you to ask questions by clicking the icon at the top of your screen. And on that note, Andrew, I'll turn things over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Steve. And uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Steve, and, uh, and uh, your team for organizing this in a slightly different manner than, you know, the way we've been doing this in the past. But um, hopefully it will still be uh, useful to a number of you. Before I start, I will, I don't know whether this is kind of setting expectations or something like that. I will um, let you in on a secret and share with you one forecast that I have already got incorrect so far this year. So Steve asked me probably at the beginning of December uh, to do this presentation again. Typically we have done it in person in Toronto in the middle of January. So I said to him, instead of doing it in the middle of January, let's push it back to the end of January because even if they delay the reopening of schools after the Christmas holidays, then surely by the end of January, they would have gone back to school. Obviously, anyone who's in Ontario knows that that hasn't happened. So I apologize in advance if you hear any screaming, crying or anything else in the background. It may be me, but it's more likely to be uh, the children. Now, when it comes to the economic outlook here in Canada and really in most countries around the world at the moment, the summary, like the executive summary of what we expect to see goes something like this. Short term, bad, second wave, enhanced restrictions, medium term, better, vaccinations, being able to reopen the economy more fully. Now, uh, probably a lot of you are thinking, well, you know, what? I could have worked that out for myself. I don't need an economist telling me that in the near term, given the second wave of COVID-19 infections, the outlook is pretty bad for the economy, but given the vaccination process, it should be getting better longer term. And you are, you know, you are right. You are right to think that. So what I want to do for the majority of this presentation is actually kind of pick out points of our forecast that may be slightly different from parts of the forecast that you've heard from other people. And in particular, why we think the recovery from this you know, very different economic recession that we've endured, health driven rather than necessarily purely economic driven, will firstly be faster than what we've seen from typical economic recoveries and also be fuller in terms of how close we get back to the previous trend. And I think that has positive implications for not-for-profit organizations, firstly through charitable contributions, but also for what it means for government revenues going forwards and, and government spending going forwards. Before I get to the positives though, we have to talk a little bit about the near term, the where we are at the moment. And where we are at the moment is, you know, as the summary slide suggested, not particularly good. What we saw over the autumn was a second wave in infections. But what we did here in Canada and also in the US, we tried to meet the second wave of infections 
with lockdowns that were nowhere near as strict as what we saw during the spring of 2020. So based on two different measures that we use, Oxford University come up with this stringency index that they call it based on you know, mask wearing and, and other such variables like that. Based on mobility data that we get from Google who are tracking apparently our every movement with our cell phones, it shows that the restrictions that we put in place at the start of this second wave weren't anywhere near as strict as what we were seeing during the spring. And clearly, they ha also haven't worked particularly well either, particularly when we talk about the largest provinces of Ontario and Quebec. What we saw as restrictions started to be put in place was that those weekly case numbers continue to go up, particularly in those provinces. And only recently, only in the last kind of couple of weeks, after those provinces put in tighter restrictions at the start of the year, only then have we actually seen some reduction in those case numbers. Now, this kind of more lax approach to lockdowns and restrictions isn't universal. It, hasn't, it didn't happen across Canada as a whole. Manitoba, for instance, where there was quite a large outbreak in terms of COVID-19 cases uh, over the autumn, they were actually fairly quick in, in applying uh, a lot stricter measures, stricter measures, you know, comparable to what we were seeing in the spring of 2020, and that had greater success in bringing down those case numbers. But what we've seen from the largest provinces of Ontario and Quebec is that they weren't strict enough to start with and had to imply more restrictions at the start of this year, which is already having an economic impact. Now, when as economists look at data, we typically, or we have in the past, looked at Statistics Canada uh, data for, for GDP, for employment and those sorts of things. But this virus is very fast moving and that means the economic consequences of this virus are very fast moving as well. By the time Statistics Canada releases their November GDP report, which is coming out at the end of this week, that's already, what, two and a half months ago. A lot has happened since then. For those of us stuck with children at home doing online learning, and that seems like a year ago, not just a couple of months ago. So what we have to do, we've had to be a bit more creative and look at some what we call high frequency data, whether that be credit card spending or whether that be what this chart shows here is the mobility data from the cell phone usage. And what this does suggest is that those two largest provinces of Ontario and Quebec, where we did have to see restrictions tightened at the start of this year, have seen an economic consequence from that. We have seen some negative in terms of the economy. Now, the good news is that those restrictions seem to be working. And this is you know, it's something we have to put above anything else is the health concern that case numbers are starting to come down. But you know, now we have this mutation of the virus, but particularly the UK one that seems to be spreading in Ontario and probably some other parts of Canada as, as well, hopefully not. So we need to be very concerned about you know, loosening these restrictions too early. It has had an economic consequence in Ontario and Quebec, but you know, we have to still be mindful about loosening these restrictions too soon. Now, the medium term projection, you know, near term bad, longer term better, is based on what we expect to see from a vaccine. Once people or sufficient number of people become vaccinated from this virus, then the economy will be able to reopen uh, more fully. Now, based on different countries' plans to vaccinate people, the UK has and is you know, quite a long way ahead and is planned to be ahead in terms of its vaccination process. The US in terms of the targets it's setting. But here in Canada, you know, we had that target of the end of September to get most people vaccinated by. Now, the bad news is that most countries around the world seem to be behind schedule when it comes to these vaccinations. It's not just us here in Canada, although, you know, when you read the papers, you know, you may you may think that way. Most countries around the world are behind schedule in, in reaching these targets. Now, that's not 100 percent unexpected because you know, the vaccine makers have been telling us that they're going to be able to produce more and more and more as time goes on. So you know, the production is going to increase. 
but it needs to increase and we need to be getting this rolled out faster in order to meet those goals. And the unfortunate thing for us here in Canada is that relative to other countries, everyone's behind schedule, it seems. Unfortunately, we seem to be further behind than others. Now, again, the most important concern regarding this is the health concern, protecting people, particularly the most vulnerable people from this virus. But there is also an economic consequence as well of being behind schedule or lagging behind other countries. Put it this way, think of it this way. Let's say that 4% of the economy isn't allowed to be reopened until more people are vaccinated. So you're talking about you know, bars and restaurants, air travel, that sort of thing. If a country is one quarter behind, so three months behind another country in being able to reopen that, that puts it's 1% of GDP behind in terms of the recovery. If you're six months behind, if you're two quarters behind, then that is 2% of GDP that you are behind in the recovery. So there are obviously very important health concerns about getting this, uh, the, getting the vaccination rolled out quickly and as soon as possible. But there is also an economic consequence of delay as well. And that's the consequence of being behind other countries in terms of the economic recovery. Now, the one area where we here in Canada are certainly not behind anybody else, um, pretty much around the globe, is government spending. The fiscal response, the government response to this pandemic has been extremely high. The deficit is at something like 20% of GDP for fiscal year 2020, 2021. And even when we look at this chart here, even relative to the decline in the economy, we have been spending more than other countries. Now, this has raised question marks, which we have talked about before. And, you know, a lot of you may have heard us talk about before about the debt levels, the sustainability uh, of this debt and whether that may lead to increased taxes or spending cuts going forwards. But part of this, part of the having to kind of stimulate the economy more than other countries is actually out, coming out of necessity. And that's because of just some of the, um, um, some of the, what this kind of recession, what this health crisis has done in terms of redistributing spending within the economy. So typically what you would do is you would stimulate the economy, you would stimulate maybe household um, spending through things like the CERB and, and other payments like that, and people would go out and spend that money. Now, in this crisis, this health crisis, people have more limited choices about where they will go and spend that money. People are not going to bars and restaurants, they are not traveling abroad, unless they're politicians anyway, and they're not doing things that they would typically do. If they are going to spend that money, they are spending it more on goods. People are spending, you know, on home gyms, um, IT equipment, so they, they can work from home, things like that. Now, these are things that we typically no longer make ourselves here in Canada. And what this chart shows is just how much domestic content there is in these goods for Canada relative to other countries. There's a lot lower. And that means we've had to run a bigger deficit because we stimulate the economy, we support household incomes, but more of that spending, more of that stimulus then drifts abroad because we are importing a lot of the goods that people are spending. So if anything, this kind of over stimulus, as it seems relative to, to other countries, has at least in part been borne out of necessity. And this, the necessity is driven by the fact that more of this stimulus is leaking abroad because we are buying goods and not services with this stimulus money. Now, as I mentioned, there has been concern about the longer term deficits and what this will mean for, for taxation, what this will mean for, for government spending going forwards. We have you know, been not particularly worried about the big deficit in 2020, because even though it's been an eye popping number, almost 400 billion Canadian dollars, and that's you know, a huge number, about 20%, of GDP. When we look at the government's long-term fiscal projections, by 2024, 2025, when hopefully none of us will remember what COVID-19 is, um, 
and hopefully everyone's vaccinated, any mutations of the virus are well under control, the deficit is expected to reduce to something around $30 billion. Now, it's still a deficit, but that $30 billion would be a very small proportion of GDP. Now, that underlying deficit could increase with the federal budget. There are certain items that the current government has been talking about that haven't been accounted for, haven't been budgeted for yet, maybe regarding childcare, uh, pharma care, that sort of thing. But let's say even if this 30 billion grows to, to $60 billion, now that would still be only around 3% of GDP. If GDP growth returns in nominal terms to about 4%, you would still be in a situation where the deficit, or the debt level as a proportion of the economy, as a proportion of the overall size of the economy would continue to come down. So yes, we have added to the debt level, but at the moment it is still sustainable because a lot of that addition to the debt level has come from this one-off factor of COVID rather than necessarily any changes in the underlying deficit that the government projects. Now, for those of you who are reliant on provincial government funding, the situation here, the story here is slightly different because some provinces weren't in a particularly good state when it comes to their public finances, even before many of us knew what a coronavirus even was. And, you know, that suggests that once this is over, we may still see some spending reductions among those provinces. What we don't expect to happen, though, is that the spending reductions that, for example, Ontario and Alberta were already doing before COVID-19 hit will be repeated among other provinces as well. Yes, they have run deficits. Yes, maybe their projections, the ones that have done long term projections, show that the deficit isn't going to fall quite as quickly as the federal government's forecasts. But what we show in this chart here is that a lot of the forecasts that have been made from, provisional, from provincial governments recently have actually been made on very conservative estimates of growth. So these were done you know, around kind of November, December of last year. And even back then, there was a lot of uncertainty still about getting a vaccine, the rollout of the vaccine. And just what we've gone through in the past year just led, I think, a lot of provinces to take a fairly conservative view of their economic background. Our forecasts are a lot more positive than particularly the Western uh, economies, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, but even Manitoba, Ontario, Nova Scotia, you know, we do expect to see some beats versus what was put into the provincial budgets. That will mean better revenue projections, hopefully, than what they had in their, in their forecasts, a return to smaller deficits quicker, and hopefully as well, will mean that there won't be a need for kind of big spending cuts or any revenue raising measures, at least in provinces outside of ones that were already being forced to do that before COVID-19 hit. Before I move off this slide, I just want to apologize for anybody in any provinces that aren't on this slide. I know I have a UK accent. I do know how many provinces there are in Canada by now. I have been here almost 10 years. Uh, it's just not all provinces uh, in this current environment put out detailed forecasts due to the uncertainty. So what we are showing here is the, is the uh, provinces that did actually put out forecasts for GDP growth in 2020 and 2021. So we are more positive than the, than the provincial kind of average when it comes to growth. And as I mentioned at the start in the summary slide, that's one of the things that I want to focus on within the presentation is why we are more positive, why we see a faster and fuller recovery from this crisis than one that was purely economic driven. Now, we've touched on one of the reasons already, and that's the amount of government stimulus that we have seen. Yes, we've seen a rise in the unemployment rate, and it's still fairly elevated versus where we were before COVID-19 hit last spring. But what we have seen is that that reduction in wage income has been dwarfed by the other incomes that have come from mainly the federal government, but also maybe provincial governments as well. And actually, this has kind of you know, driven something which is very unusual for a recessionary period where we've seen the economy fall into recession. We've seen the unemployment rate go up, but household incomes 
on aggregate have also gone up as well. And actually, when you compare Canada versus other countries, household incomes have risen more. Spending has been restrained because you know, people, there's only so many home gyms people need. People want to go out and spend money at bars and restaurants, but they can't or they don't feel safe enough to do so at the moment. So household savings, the amount that people have saved during this pandemic because of that income support, but also because their spending has been reduced, has been a lot higher than firstly what we were seeing before the coronavirus hit, but also that increase has been even higher than what we have seen in other countries as well. So households here in Canada have that saving on the sideline to be able to spend, to be able to redeploy that when the economy does reopen. And a lot of this saving is kind of just parked in their bank accounts, in people's checking accounts. Now, some of it has gone to pay down debt. Some of it will have flowed through uh, into the equity market as well. But what we show on the left hand side here is that in terms of personal deposits, in terms of what people are putting in their bank accounts, we've got about $90 billion of excess cash. So those people, those households will be ready to redeploy that money when the economy is ready to be fully reopened. Where they will redeploy that? Well, that's kind of what we show on the right hand side here. There will be some normalization, some reduction in people buying goods, some increase in people spending on services, going out to restaurants, for example, rather than buying all their food from the grocery store. But there are also some uh, deferred services that people just haven't been spending money on, which probably before the pandemic hit would be considered essential services. So, you know, people go in for dental checks, that sort of thing. Even when people start doing that again, that will have a positive in terms of the economy. People getting their hair cut even from anybody who wasn't their wife or their husband. Again, once people start doing that again, then that will be a positive for the economy. And hopefully, as this money does get redeployed, we would hope to see some of this being redeployed into charitable contributions as well. I'm not sure this happens straight away necessarily. I think what will happen first is that there will be some normalization of spending, some redeployment of this money in terms of services. But what that will do is it will drive economic growth. It will drive the unemployment rate down. And when people start seeing headlines about a lower unemployment rate, they will start feeling better about their own financial situation. They will realize that they have some spare cash and maybe that's when you see a pickup in charitable donations. So it may not happen this year necessarily. I know it's been a tough time for a lot of charities, but I think this is going to be a positive going forward. People have this excess savings. They will redeploy it. And when they do redeploy it and the economic pickup um, you know, gets faster, people will believe um, or will feel more comfortable with their own financial uh, well-being. And that's when you will get a pickup or at least a bigger pickup in charitable contributions. Now, the other reason that we are positive about the recovery from this, and this is kind of unrelated to the near term outlook about have people having this cash to redeploy when the economy reopens, is that we expect that the recovery from this will be um, different from what we have seen in the past. When we have seen in the past that recessions actually do longer lasting damage on a recovery in terms of different economies. Now, what this slide shows here, and I hope you can see it because it seems a uh, doesn't seem it seems a little blurry on my screen. I hope that's just me. Um, what this chart shows here is the U.S. example. This is the prime example, really, over the last kind of 50 years of what us economists call scarring from a recession. And scarring is not when my you know when my, when my kid runs down the the street and falls over and grazes his knee. Scarring in an economic sense is not returning to the previous path you are on after a recession. And again, the prime example here has been what happened in the US after the financial crisis. The US was growing around kind of three or four percent a year before the financial crisis. That financial crisis hit, business investment fell, we got weakness in uh, the financial sector. 
in the real estate sector, which tend to be very high productivity areas of the economy. And the economy there never returns to that same state. And this would be a bad thing, for example, for government revenues, um, because you would never get back to that previous trend. And this is the situation that we don't want to be in, because this is the kind of situation where you may, in kind of two or three years' time, be having to think about spending cuts or tax increases on a provincial or a federal budget to try and get the deficits down, because you can't do that organically through economic growth. Now, we don't expect this to happen, or at least nowhere near the same extent as we have seen in the past, because of some of the uh, idiosyncrasies of this current recession, this health-driven crisis versus the purely economic and the financial-driven crisis that the US saw all those years ago. Now, one of the key reasons for this is that because of the government stimulus, because this has been a more services-driven downturn, what we have seen is relative to that financial crisis in the US, Yes, we have seen sectors of the economy that have been hit very, very badly by the coronavirus and the economic impacts that that has had. Airlines, bars and restaurants, that sort of thing. But because of the government support, that very, very hard, those very, very hard hit sectors haven't led to as, as much weakness in other areas of the economy. There hasn't been that kind of feed through effect into other areas of the economy. In the US, the chart here shows during the financial crisis, only about 40% of the total job losses peaked to trough were in sectors which you would consider the ones hardest hit by the US recession. So you're talking in that case, real estate, for example, uh, finance, that sort of thing. Today, where we are today, it's exactly the reverse. 60% of all the job losses have been driven just in the worst affected areas. Now, those worst affected areas are different. You're talking bars, restaurants, that sort of thing. But it has been much more concentrated in terms of where the employment hits have been. And this suggests to us that when you do get a vaccination um, you know, fully um, rolled out, when these areas of the economy that have been very badly hit are allowed to reopen, not just have people got the money to spend on those areas, but they haven't had the impact on other sectors of the economy. So you could get a fuller recovery in terms of employment. Now, the other reason why we don't expect to see quite the same level of scarring that we have seen in previous downturns is that, and I touched on this er earlier, most of the hardest hit sectors of the economy have been more services driven. That has meant that they have also been areas of the economy that don't typically need to see as much business investment to get them up and running. So what will happen if you close a, a theatre company, for example, if you close um, even a restaurant, you don't need as much capital investment. You don't need as much upfront money to reopen that than you would do, for example, a, ma a manufacturing plant that had closed during the financial crisis, either in the US or here in Canada. So it is easier and quicker to reopen the areas of the economy that have been hardest hit. Now, the standout, the kind of the, the difference um, in terms of sectors where this isn't 100% applicable is the oil and gas sector. And anyone um, joining from Alberta or even Saskatchewan or Newfoundland, maybe turn your volume down for about a minute um, as I get through this next part, because the lack of investment that we have seen in the oil and gas sector in 2020 will have a more permanent impact on the economy there. And you know that's what we show on the right hand side uh, of this uh, chart relative to forecasts oil production forecasts from 2019 before the coronavirus hit, before COVID-19 got its name. We were looking at a fairly steady path upwards in terms of oil production. Now, that hit, we got very briefly negative prices of oil, which was you know, something that most economists thought would never happen. And we saw not just production cuts, but we also saw cuts in investment within the oil sector as well. And what we show on the right-hand side, uh, the chart here, is that relative to Canadian GDP, this lowers the level 
of GDP in future years by about 0.15%. Now, if you're thinking about Alberta GDP, for example, this would be a lot bigger. This would be around half a percent. So there is a longer term impact from not having that investment in 2020 for the oil and gas sector. And that will particularly be important for provinces such as Alberta and also the other oil producers of Saskatchewan and Newfoundland as well. And what this has meant is that when you talk about that scarring, that kind of feed through impact of job losses in one area feeding through into job losses in the other area, what we have seen in those oil producing provinces is that we have seen more of the decline and we show hours worked here rather than employment, but it would be very similar in both. We've seen more of the decline in hours worked come in in areas of the economy outside of those high touch service industries. So for most of the country and particularly uh, provinces um, in, uh, in Atlantic Canada and even Quebec, what we have seen is that most of the decline, most of the, the missing activity, so to speak, at the end of last year was due to those areas of the economy, food, accommodation, um, cultural services, that sort of thing, those areas of the economy that weren't allowed to still fully reopen. But what, we saw, what we've seen in Alberta and Saskatchewan is that there have been more job losses in what we call here other industries. So the oil and gas industry would be um, a prime example of that. And this suggests to us that you know, once the economy is allowed to reopen, once we do get a vaccine, yes, it will be beneficial to those provinces still, but there will still be a little bit or a longer term impact. And some of those job losses uh, in other sectors of the economy may take a little bit longer to come back. Now, one of the other interesting things on this chart here is also just to compare Quebec to Ontario. Here in Ontario, we've seen about a 4% hole still in terms of hours worked at the end of last year compared to where we were a year before. But only about half of that is due to those areas such as food, as food and accommodation and other services. There are or there has been a little bit of pain in other sectors which may not be quite as quick to come back. You contrast that to Quebec, where the overall decline in hours worked has been very similar, but the skew has been very much towards those high touch service industries and actually other industries in the economy have actually seen some growth versus where they were in 2019. And this makes us think that Ontario versus Quebec may lag a little bit, at least in the near term, in terms of the economic recovery. Now, anybody in Alberta, Saskatchewan, the oil producers, you will be able to put your volume uh, back up now because we're starting to get to a little bit of a, a positive outlook. Even though there will be that longer lasting damage, even though by 2022, if we thought of the level of GDP versus where we were in 2019, there would be a bigger hole there because we will start getting oil production back. OPEC is doing the hard work in production cuts and, and keeping oil prices up. So Alberta oil production is coming back because we are seeing some recovery in investment, not a full recovery to 2019, but some recovery. We actually have growth rates for Alberta, Saskatchewan, a little bit above the national average. So there will be at least that positivity in the near term. In level terms, we're not quite there. We're not. We're going to see a bigger gap versus where we were, but at least the growth rates will look good. And as I said earlier, relative to what was in provincial budget forecasts, the, those growth rates are actually pretty positive, the ones that we expect. Now, I'm going to go on to talk a bit about what all this means for um, exchange rates, what this means for interest rates. Now, one of the funny things that we've seen in terms of financial markets throughout much of the last year is that after COVID-19 hit, we saw the Federal Reserve in the US state that it was going to wait quite a long time before hiking interest rates. It was going to wait to see inflation really start to pick up before it started hiking interest rates. And what that has meant is that for most of the last year, the financial markets have been pricing in a earlier Bank of Canada hike than the Federal Reserve. And this has been, has kind of contributed to a recovery in the Canadian dollar and actually a stronger Canadian dollar than what we were seeing before COVID-19 hit. Now, we don't agree with that because 
even though we do expect a faster, fuller recovery for the Canadian economy relative to past recessions, we still don't see the output gap close in. And this, by, by output gap, we mean kind of the gap between where economic activity is today or in the future in our forecasts versus where it would have been if the previous trend had continued. So we don't expect to get completely back to that previous trend until the end of 2022. Now in the US, they've seen, well, firstly, they didn't see quite the same level of decline in terms of economic activity, but they're kind of supercharging the recovery now by further fiscal stimulus. And then you know, the new president has this big stimulus plan as well. So we would expect the recovery to that previous trend to be happening faster in the US. So what we would expect to happen is that the Federal Reserve will hike interest rates maybe a year earlier than they currently promise. They currently promise that interest rates are pretty much like diamonds. They're going to last forever. These low interest rates are going to last forever, or at least until 2024 in their projections. But you know, given how hazy economists' crystal balls are sometimes, that may as well be forever. But what we expect to see is that the economy, the economic recovery will be faster than they think. Inflation maybe will come back faster than they think and that they will be forced to hike interest rates a little bit earlier than they plan. The Bank of Canada would then follow them. And as that starts getting priced in to markets, that's when you would see a weakening in the Canadian dollar. Now, it's not going to weaken back to the levels that we saw at the early part of the COVID-19 crisis where you know, we were above 140 or kind of in the 60 cent level, but we will get to around kind of 130 and above in terms of the uh, USD CAD again. And that would be a positive, you know, looking forwards for the manufacturing sector here in Canada. What we have seen in the past and what the Bank of Canada itself has become, you know, very attuned to is that if the Canadian dollar gets too strong, that starts to weigh on the economic recovery, particularly if there's no you know, real big investment within the oil and gas sector. The Canadian dollar where it is today or even stronger would lead to export growth or the contribution from exports to GDP, to the economic recovery, being about half of what it would be with a Canadian dollar weaker than it is today. So what we expect to see is that the Bank of Canada will kind of refocus markets and you know, suggest to them that they are going to be hiking later than the Federal Reserve. The economic recovery here, while strong, is going to happen a little slower, and that will have a slight negative impact on the Canadian dollar. Now, I mentioned earlier that we'll talk a little bit about inflation. And again, I hope that you can, this slide is showing out better on, uh, on your screens than it is on mine. But what has been very strange and another kind of peculiarity of the COVID-19 crisis versus uh, other you know, more typical economic downturns is that we have seen pockets of inflation. Now, what the chart on the left-hand side will hopefully show you, if you can see the line, is that personal services CPI has been going up. So this is one area where you know, there's been a lot of closures. People really kind of feel uncomfortable about kind of going out and spending on these services. But because there's been a supply constraint as well, um, you know, people, hairdressers, for example, aren't allowed to take as many customers as before. Because there's been increased costs on these industries, PPE expenses and that sort of thing, we've actually seen inflation rise in areas of the economy where we've also seen demand fall. And the same can be shown in food services as well, particularly when it comes to takeout uh, services. So we're already seeing pockets of inflation being slightly higher than people would necessarily expect given the high um, uh, unemployment rate that we're seeing today. And this will only start to kind of increase even more with the stimulus that has been talked about in the US. Now, I touched upon this earlier, but the Biden plan, the stimulus plan is in the tune of 1.9 trillion US dollars. Now, Please don't try and count the, the number of dollars in this, uh, in this uh, display here. I can almost guarantee it's not 1.9 trillion because that is an awful lot of money. That's about 9% of US GDP. Even if only half of that gets passed, even if only half of that gets passed, you're talking about a stimulus of something close to 5% of the US economy when 
the gap in economic activity versus where it was before is actually thinner, is smaller than that 5%. So you'd actually kind of start to generate inflation in certain areas. So, you know, one of the things I think we need to watch for over the next year or so is, yes, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada will keep interest rates fairly low um, on in terms of the overnight rates. But those longer term interest rates that, you know, affect mortgage costs, they may aff affect other term borrowing, you know, those are going to drift higher. We're already seeing that in the US with the stimulus talk, but we would expect that to happen here in Canada as well. Those longer term interest rates will start to move up. Now, this here is the economic summary slide. I might not go through all of these numbers here, or all of these points, just because of trying to get uh, some time for your questions. But you know, the overall theme that most economists are coming up with at the moment, short term bad, medium term better, that's not telling you much. What we need to think about is just how much better this recovery can be compared to recoveries that we've seen in, uh, in other kind of economic crisis. And what we think is that this recovery will be faster and it will be fuller than those, um, than those other recoveries because more of this has been driven by services. It's not capital intensive. You can reopen those industries quicker. Also, government support has meant that the, the, the weakness has been very concentrated in certain sectors. And you know, those reasons combined with others make us more optimistic about getting at least closer to the previous trend we were on. That will be good for government revenues um, and hopefully will mean that even at a provincial basis, those provinces that weren't having to reduce spending before COVID-19 hit probably won't have to go down that route again. We will see enough of a recovery in the economy where they won't need that spending reduction. They won't, they won't need that revenue increase uh, to make up for it. And we would hope as well longer term, and as I said, this may not happen straight away, that the cash that people have, the households have, because of the generous income support, because they haven't been spending in other areas, will eventually trickle through into charitable contributions as well. The near term may be bad, but the longer term, the medium term, the longer term, there are reasons to be positive, particularly relative to what we typically see um, in an economic downturn. Steve, I'm going to leave it there. I hope you have uh, some questions for me. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, please don't make them too tough, at least the first ones. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening. And Steve, I'll pass it over to you for questions. Well, that's great, Andrew. Andrew. Thanks. Thank you very much. We're going to open up the discussion for Q&A. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier, if you do have any questions, please click the icon at the top of your screen and, uh, and type in your question. At this point, it doesn't look like anybody has submitted anything, but uh, we'll give people a few minutes. Uh, why, and why don't I uh, start things off, Andrew? Um, there's been lots of discussion of a K-shaped recovery. Uh, like, do you see any of the sectors that have been hardest hit by the uh, pandemic having trouble ultimately recovering? Like, do you see that there's going to be any permanent structural changes in the in the economy coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, that's a good question. Though. Yeah, the economists from, uh, you know, since the beginning of this have been throwing out different letters for the shape of this, uh, for, for the shape of the recovery. But uh, yeah, the K ones are still fairly new and that relates to, to some industries doing very, very badly. Some industries actually benefiting from what we're seeing and creating this K shape. Now, you know, as I mentioned going through the, the, the slides, most of the sectors that are doing very, very badly from this pandemic at least have one advantage where, you know, when it is um, positive for them or when, when it is possible for them to reopen, they should be able to reopen fairly quickly relative to, for example, if we had seen a lot of pain in the manufacturing sector where there needs to be more upfront investment to be able to reopen a factory and that sort of thing. So, you know, I think that is one positive when we come out of this. When it comes to if there are kind of longer term issues, you know, some of that you know, really boils down to um, the mutation of the virus and, and how long we are um, dealing with this. I think, you know, for example, you know, the, air in, the uh, airline industry, uh, for example, if we are 
they're seeing waves of COVID-19 infections and different mutations kind of come and go for a few years, it is going to put people, it will make people a little bit more wary about traveling long distances, being you know that far away from home. It may also add to the cost of travel in terms of medical insurance, that sort of thing. So that becomes a bit more prohibitive. So I think that there are some possible long-term negatives for certain industries. Um, how big those are depends on how long we're we're dealing with uh, the crisis. But you know, overall, we're pretty positive that when these industries can reopen, there is the money there for people to spend, but it's also easier for those industries to reopen relative to, to what we've seen when other industries have been badly hit in the past. Okay, thanks, Andrew. We have received a number of questions uh, in the last couple of minutes. So one easy answer uh, uh, is, will the slides be shared? And the answer is yes, we will share Andrew's presentation uh, with all of the participants on this call through your CIBC relationship manager. We'll get them out to you uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, some other questions. Um, from your view, will the recovery keep pushing up uh, housing prices, which, uh, which are already very high? Yeah, this is a, another strange idiosyncrasy of this recession, as well as this being the recession where household incomes uh, rise. It's also the recession that house prices and housing activity rises as well. So it's uh, it's a strange phenomenon. Part of this has been driven, or part of what you're seeing in terms of house price growth on a, on a, either a national basis or a provincial basis, is you know, partly a change in what houses are being sold. So people are moving to bigger, more expensive houses because they want more space, because, you know, having four kids at home, homeschooling in an apartment just isn't going to work. Um, so that kind of flatters the house price numbers a little bit. But I think, you know, what we are going to see is that for the, at least the next year, in, uh, interest rates are going to stay fairly low. I think the housing market is it's not going to be as hot as it was at times in 2020, but it's still kind of going to go up. The real test will come, you know, if we are right and this is a fuller recovery, we start to see some inflation, we start to see those longer term interest rates push up. That's going to cause mortgage rates to push up come kind of 2022. And that's when you get a, a kind of a real test for the housing market. So I think actually you know, the housing market is going to go slightly in, in, in reverse of what we're seeing in the general economy. The hotter the recovery in the general economy becomes, maybe the cooler the housing market becomes because you know, interest rates will start to get pushed up as well. Okay, uh, here's another one. How do you see the government digging out of the deficit? What levers will they use? Your slide showed a significant recovery in 2022. Yeah, so as I mentioned during the slides, you know, m most of the recovery from this big deficit, this, you know, really eye-popping $400 billion deficit that has been run, will happen fairly naturally. Like most of this spending has been driven by the necessities of COVID-19. It has been driven by policies that have been put in place just because of this virus. So, you know, buy and as I showed, I showed, um, I think it was the 2024, 2025 uh, uh, forecast, you know, getting back to around 30 to 40 billion dollar deficits. By then, you know, you would expect all of these COVID related issues to have hopefully gone away and the underlying deficit isn't actually that large. So, you know, you wouldn't expect to see much or you wouldn't necessarily need much in terms of spending cuts or revenue increase in measures to reduce that deficit. A lot of that deficit will happen organically. Now, whether that is still the case after the budget that we're expecting, you know, probably in March time from the federal government, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But at the moment where the deficits stand, most of the deficits are being driven by these special factors related to COVID-19. Okay. Another question is, usually there's a lag in expansion in the charitable sector. You say that activity will ramp up in the near term. Does that imply that the lag will be shorter compared to previous uh, previous downturns for the charitable sector? You know what, I, I would hope so. Um, you know, as I mentioned during the uh, during the presentation, I think what we're going to see in the second half of this year and into next year, when sectors of the economy are allowed to reopen, people are going to redeploy 
the money that they have uh, got on the sidelines. Now, that's going to drive the unemployment rate down and people will feel a little bit more, um, a little bit better about their own personal finances. And at that point, I think that's when you get a more significant pickup in charitable contributions. Now, you know, I would expect the economic pickup to start the second half of this year into the second, into kind of the first half of next year. And then maybe there being a lag, you know, into kind of 2022, maybe a bit later into 2022. But, you know, given the lag that you normally see and give just because of the, the amount of, of cash that has been on the sidelines, I would hope that the lag between economic recovery and, and charitable contribution recovery to be shorter this time. Okay. Uh, question, knowing the magnitude of revenue to governments from oil and gas, how does the loss impact the longer term economic picture? Yeah, so again, this is, you know, you're talking that the main hit here being, you know, the oil, the oil producing provinces of, uh, of Alberta, Saskatchewan and Newfoundland. You know, apart from Saskatchewan, those provinces were kind of in restraint mode even before COVID-19, because obviously after 2014, we've been dealing with low oil prices for, for quite a long time. So, you know, revenues did take a hit last year. That did lead to an increase in um, uh, in terms of the debt levels. What I would say, though, and again, kind of going back to one of the slides that I showed in terms of the nominal GDP projections put in by the provincial governments versus what we expect now, given that oil prices have recovered, you know, they are very conservative at the moment, or they were very conservative with their previous projections. So at the moment, looking just one year ahead, I would expect them, and you don't know exactly for sure when it comes to forecasting provincial revenues, but I would expect them to actually be ahead of plan when it comes to those oil revenues. So you know, yes, they have taken a hit, but maybe the hit hasn't been quite as big as they would have budgeted for in the, in the fall updates that we saw kind of November, December time. Okay, we've got a couple of questions about the level of, of indebtedness. Um, so one question is, is the predict prediction that while our overall debt will grow substantially, it will have a negligible effect on the economy as a whole? Yeah, so I think this is, you know, when it comes to the government debt level, um, you know, the, the increase that we've seen in the deficit this year, the rise that we've seen in the debt level, um, you know, we're not particularly worried about that because as I said, you know, a lot of that should organically, or at least the debt to GDP level should organically come, start to come down when the economy starts to recover and those underlying deficits aren't particularly big. Now, when it comes to um, household debt, and, you know, this is something that we normally spend about half the presentation talking about, and people haven't really spoken about this for, for the last nine months now because of this virus. Um, when it comes to the household debt levels, you know, we have seen a little bit of a, of a drop in terms of debt to income because incomes have been bolstered by these uh, government payments. But, you know, maybe the decline hasn't been quite as as much as maybe we would have anticipated or have hoped for. So, you know, maybe some households should have been a little bit more prudent in terms of the use of this income when it comes to the debt levels. Um, but as of now, the government debt levels, we're not too worried about household debt levels with interest rates very low, even the high debt levels relative to income, you know, we're not particularly worried about yet. But as I mentioned, in terms of the question related to the housing sector, the real test will come if the recovery is stronger, if inflation recovers stronger, if interest rates rise faster, maybe. And again, this is a 2023 story, probably rather than even a 2022. But if all those things happen, that's when it becomes more of a test for household incomes and household debt levels. OK, and here's a question about the labor market. Any thoughts on the impact of a third of the people, I guess the uh, population, having long lasting health issues as a result of COVID-19 on the economy, the labor market, health care costs, for example, boomers leaving the labor market earlier? Yeah, I mean, clearly that's something that um, as economists probably uh, aren't qualified to to answer, but it's certainly a risk. You know, if people do have underlying health issues, which, for example, maybe, you know, they 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 feel unable to go to the office um, quite as often as they did, or they, you know, they feel as if they're 
you know, tired more often, they can't go to work, that will reduce the pool of labor and that will reduce the potential for economic growth down the line. And that will lead to a bigger scarring effect on the economy and make it harder to, for us to get back up to that previous trend. I don't believe you know, that the number was cited, I think, Steve, did you say 30% or a third or something like one that? One third, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not sure all of that one third will have um, lingering health effects that are bad enough to prevent them from entering the labor market. Um, you know, maybe it's only a small fraction of that, but it certainly is a risk going forwards and certainly something that we'll have to, you know, think about when it comes to, um, you know, listening to what, you know, the doctors are saying regarding the virus. Right. Okay, well, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. So one question is about equity market performance. Uh, we're seeing the, the return uh, on investment in the equity market has been quite strong. Will that trend continue or when the current uh, economy returns to normal, uh, will you know, the equity market cool down and, and rates of in, uh, return decline? Yeah, there's always a there's always a warning sign when you ask in an economist about the equity markets, because <laughs> us economists tend to be fairly conservative. And I think, Steve, we did one of these uh, forecasts or one of these outlooks in June of last year. And if if we if I got asked the same question in June of last year about equity market valuations, I probably would have said that they seemed high already by then. And obviously, they're even higher now. So, you know, this is something you know, maybe it's similar to, to what we were describing about house prices, where you get, you know, the recovery from this crisis, even if it is faster and fuller than it is from a normal economic downturn, because of what that means for interest rates, and that's, you know, an alternative form of investment from the equity market, maybe it is a slight negative for, for the equity market versus, you know, what you would see from a typical recession. There does seem to already be quite a bit of positive news priced into equity markets. But again, the uh, the warning sign uh, regarding that comment is I would have said the same thing in June of last year um, when equity markets were probably a lot lower than they are today. OK, fair enough. And last question. This is kind of a, a global question. What is the estimated time for supply chain recovery, especially for uh, Asian countries? Yeah, well, we actually one of the one of the things which has been, you know, very strange about this uh, crisis, um, or one of the other things, because I've mentioned quite a few already, uh, is that when it comes to global trade, trade volumes globally, those have already fully recovered to where we were, where they were before the pandemic struck. Now, you know, in Kind of April, May, June time, people were talking about like the end of globalization, people sourcing more things from home. But because people, households have got this money to spend, they can only spend it on goods. What we have seen actually is a rise or much faster recovery in global trade than I think anyone would have anticipated. Now, I do believe going forwards, there will be a greater lean into to sourcing at least essential things at home versus um abroad. So, you know, we will probably see a pullback in this. There will be some dent to globalization, but we have actually, you know, when you just look at global trade volumes, we have actually already seen pretty much a full recovery from, you know, where we were in, in January of uh, 2020. Okay, that's great, Andrew. There were a few questions that we didn't have time to get to, but what I will do is uh, I'll follow up with Andrew and any other relevant CIBC uh, colleagues and we'll try and uh, get these additional questions answered uh, after uh, after the presentation. So, Andrew, uh, thank you very much for uh, your thoughts today. I think you raised a lot of very interesting points for consideration. And based on the, the questions from the uh, participants, I think you've also stimulated some good thinking about, you know, what 2021 and beyond holds for the uh, public and not-for-profit sector. So thank you very much. Uh, as we mentioned previously, we will send all of Andrew's uh, or presentation to all of the participants uh, through your CIBC relationship manager. Uh, we're also recording this webcast, and so um, you'll be able to access the recording, I think, for at least 90 days uh, using the same link that we included in the invitation for today's session. We should have that recording set up by, I think, end of day tomorrow at the latest. So if you think any of your colleagues would be interested in watching the webcast, uh, please feel free to share the invitation and the link with them.
Um, so in closing, uh, our CRBC team, again, would like to thank you for participating today. And we'd also like to thank you uh, and your organizations for the great work that you're doing on the front lines to help us all get through the pandemic. Uh, we know that this continues to be a very, very difficult time for our clients in the public and not-for-profit sector. So if there's anything that we can do to provide assistance, uh, we'd encourage you to reach out to your CIBC relationship manager. Uh, and on that note, we'll conclude this webcast. So thank you very much, everyone.